So this is our, our last lecture in this series, and it um, gives me enormous pleasure to introduce, um, along with Helena, the, <coughs> the, the, the transcribing team, Tracing History Trust and transcribing team. They are the leading lights. They're the ones who do this incredible work in conjunction with others, but it's Maureen and Helena who have this special expertise, special relationship. So Maureen studied librarianship at UNISA and gained extensive work experience around South Africa and Michigan before joining the prestigious Africana Library in Kimberley, where she was part of a team which engendered the publication of a series of manuscripts relating to the early history of Kimberley. At that time, it was largely sponsored by Harry Oppenheimer. And as part of the series, she wrote Images of Kimberley, a postcard collection, and the other series was called Petticoat Pioneers, the history of the pioneer women who lived on the diamond fields in the early years, which is tough stuff. She was then approached by the Soil Plaiki Educational Trust to organize a fledgling library in the Soil Plaiki Museum, which had been his modest house in Angel Street. And at the same time, she wrote the biography of this remarkable man. With his benevolent spirit hovering, there came to fruition Peaceable Warrior, The Life and Times of Soil T. Plaiki. Then, Maureen joined the transcription team in Cape Town in 2004. Therein lies another story. We'll keep that for next time. <laughs> and she continues her transcription and translation work under the auspices of the Tracy History Trust. In a nutshell, that's Maureen, and it doesn't even scratch the surface. And today she's going to be talking about medical matters and women. Thank you, Maureen. <laughs> questions until the end of the talk. Yes. Would you prefer that? Yes. I so. yes. If that's all right, Maureen would prefer that. Thank you. Okay, I have not been able to sleep, but I think there's some pretty areas in stories. What strange paths we are led on to where on a particular day strangers meet and history which has long been hidden from me can suddenly be revealed. I've always felt that in some mysterious way my own path had been mapped out without my having too much of a choice. Exasperated by my total inability to fathom even the basics of accountancy and irascible teacher took a hand. He told me that I spent so much time reading there was only one choice for me, by privilege. And so it was. After a peripatetic career at various libraries, I joined the staff of the Africana Library in Kimberley in 1991. My life was now about to take an unexpected turn. One morning, I came upon an old tin trunk, stuffed with letters, diaries, and notes, written mostly by women. I transcribed all of these and my excitement was catching. From this beginning, there was the Kimberley Africana series. My petticoat pioneers celebrates the bravery of those women who followed their hearts and the dreams of the men folk to the Shemira of Diamond Growth and shade in the shading of the southern city, as I put it in my dedication. But the stories of many of these women were inevitably full of pain, as were those of the women who came to the Cape many years before them. Their arrival on the diamond fields to join their husbands inevitably brought pregnancies and the attendant problems, with little available medical care or comforts to be had. Early barrier records in meticulous copper plate script give natural fact descriptions of death during childhood or of fever. 
prior just to the fact that motherless children were taken care of by aunts or grandmothers, some of whom came to the dining fields for this for city cleaning. Often older siblings had the responsibility of rearing the younger family members. Kimberley's pioneer, the choice fund and Gladstone cemeteries abound with pitifully small graves. Mothers and children often shared a resting place. 22-year-old Catherine Doherty, who died on 15 October 1875, lies with a stillborn daughter who died on the 13th of October. The family ties brought my husband and I to Cape Town, and my daughter persuaded me to apply for a vacant position on a team tasked with transcribing the inventories of the Chamber of Good Hope covering the years 1673 to 1834, known as TEPC, Transcriptions of Estate Papers at the Cape. Of the history of the VFC, I know nothing at all. I have not studied Afrikaans Netherlands, although I read Finnish and Dutch literature for my own pleasure, and Afrikaans, my other home language, had, after all, its origins in 18th century Dutch. I appeared before an August, August panel after having been handed a vast volume opened at a page of to me illegible Gothic script and asked to transcribe it. To my utter astonishment, I was appointed, and two days later, they began the new phase of my life, which has proved me much joy and a great deal of enlightenment. The day after joining the team in the Cape Archives, my eye caught a familiar name, Jacques Pinard. This inventory was much shorter than the one I had transcribed the day before, and listed only the very basics needed for farming and caring for a family. I was born, Jacques Pinard, who soon became Jacobus Pinard in the Dutch community, was a Huguenot refugee who arrived at the Cape in 1688, and was the progenitor of my father's side of my family. Indeed, quite a few of my cousins still bear various names of the name Jacques. Jacques settled on a farm in Jacquesstein, where several other French families had already found a home. The very next day, a great shout arose from the table in front of me. A fellow new appointee who had witnessed my excitement the day before, had met his progenitor, who was fastened, who was rather more prosperous than mine, and of Dutch origin. For two total strangers to be granted such unexpected grace within two days can surely only have been brought about by a nudge from beyond. What can one hope to discover among the bare bones of inventories? A surprising amount of information about life in the Cape in the 18th and 19th centuries. Notes within the formulaic and on the face of the boring lists of the belongings of the recently dead. Once you've learned to negotiate your way around the language and the script, it immediately becomes obvious that there were a considerable number of extremely wealthy people in the Cape who lived in great style. Many owned farms as well as townhouses, lavishly equipped with furniture fashioned from exotic hardwoods from the east as well as the local yellow wooden steamboat. There were carpets from far flung regions on the trade route. On the walls were family portraits of other paintings and mirrors in elegant frames. In glaring contrast to the extravagant light styles of the elite, many people in the Cape lived and died in abject poverty, only little more than the clothes on their backs. Some of the farmers granted land by the VFC had the very minimum of equipment to development. It was expected of them to deliver tithes of what meat or any other produce to the company and adverse conditions of the prohibitiveness. Large families lived in very little and suffered great deprivation. In later years, 
as the interior of the river, it seems that many people lived in the ox wagons. The inventories list only livestock, the usual feather bed, a bucket or two, a few tin plates, forks and spoons, iron pots, and perhaps a felt skip. The inventory is, despite the stilted official needs, revealing that human nature has remained immutable. There was avarice and cruelty, love and kindness, brooding resentment and deep despair. Locked into the inventories are stories of the tragedies which befell these long dead people. One of the saddest that I encountered was that of a young farmer, young Henry Kutsia and his wife, Esther Brits, who committed suicide, leaving a nine-year-old son. The inventory shows that they owned nothing but a basin, two tin plates, a spoon, a fork, a feather bed, three pillows, a hundred sheep, thirty goats, two old horses, and a rifle. No mention is made of the fate of the child. The estate would have been auctioned by the orphan chamber to raise money for the boy, but as the auction fee, auctioneer's fee, came to 42 Greek dollars, this could not have been a great deal. Exposed to these documents for five days a week, as time passed, each member of the team developed a special interest in different aspects of the society of the town. My own attention was caught by the exceptionally high death rate of young women in childbirth or shortly thereafter, probably of liberal fever, leaving husbands to cope with young families. In a sad little letter, a young Stellenbosch farmer begged the orphan chamber to defer his journey to Cape Town to settle his affairs, as his wife had died giving birth and the baby was only four years old. In 1817, two young unmarried women in outlying areas died in childbirth. Their inventories reveal that they had good clothes and some jewelry. It would appear that the men who recorded their property may have been the fathers. It would well have been that there was no minister available to marry the parents or baptize the children. Poignantly, the inventory of one of the young women lists a trunk containing an entire they yet lovingly prepared for the baby. The inventory of the other young woman notes that the baby had died unbaptized five days after her mother. The tragedies of these deaths prompted me to undertake a detailed analysis of these women, their spouses, the number of children born to them, the date of the official inventory, and where possible, the date of the first inventory which was carried out by family, friends, or the field committees, the district in which they lived. The date of birth, or the age of the child at the time of the official recording, and the possible age of the deceased at the time of death, noted. However, not all the names which appeared in the inventories could be found in published genealogies, so I also used church records to research marriages and baptisms as well as death registers. Despite the incomplete records, certain trends emerged. Many deaths occurred when the first child was born, and these mothers tended to be very young. It was not uncommon to find that the ages varied between 16 and 19 years, and one of them was only 14. Of all the deaths recorded, 217, 34.2%, were first confinements. Families tended to be large, and it was not uncommon that women who were only in their 30s or early 40s had given birth to numerous children. The largest family recorded, number 13, and the mother died at 43. Formal deaths were recorded in the outlying areas than in Cape Town. There were a number of reasons for this, the most obvious being that there were doctors as well as trained midwives in Cape Town. <coughs> Whereas in the far flung districts, medical help was very limited. There were a few physicians, among them the district surgeon of Grafrenia, 
you're going to feed your person, you was to contribute greatly to your understanding of the circumstances surrounding so many of these unnecessary and devastating tragedies. There were, of course, deaths in Cape Town too, child being, being hazardous at the best of times, and even the elite were not exempt. The first example concerns Baroness Cornelia von Rede von Azuri. She was born on the 20th of October 1740 and married Juan Antonio Terence in Cape Town on the 14th of December 1765. She died in childbirth on the 13th of November 1771. The other death in the family was that of Susanna Margareta von Schoer, who was baptized in Cape Town on the 19th of July 1750. She married Willem Ferdinand van Rede van Utsuri in Cape Town on the 26th of March 1774 and died in Chambers on the 19th of September 1776. It became very clear that women living in the Cape and environs stood a much better chance of survival than those followed the field during the years 1720 to 1834. The records show that during this period, the Cape District, which included the Kepler and the Bainberg, accounted for 37 deaths. Drakenstein, the home of Fisher Jürgen, recorded only 70, 19. This may describe the fact that they had among their number some train, a train physician, Jean Brier and Lucy. In Stellenbosch, where the deceased number 52. There were also two human physicians, Jean Durand and Paul Lefebvre. But moving further afield, where there was little or no medical help, Swinon Dam was 119 souls, and Grafrenet 105, in spite of the efforts of Dr. Hessner. The one to Hessner's important unpublished medical treatise written in atrocious handwriting in 1793 while he was district surgeon of Rafferty from the start of the series. series. That is, the documents in the MOOC series, which also reveal a high incidence of physical defects, insanity and epilepsy, and blindness occurs in more than one member of certain families. The question arises whether only bad midwifery could be banned or whether genetics or inbreeding could have played a role. <coughs> Hessner was especially admired their students who had found that medicine was under the tyranny of the most despicable and deceitful superstitions and agreed that the only way to get rid of the old idols was to discover the simplest sources of health and to teach the people accordingly. He intended to follow this renowned physician and not to excuse any practices, lifestyles, and treatment of illnesses that had been proven to be detrimental. In Netherlands, Africa, as he called it, People also made use of herbs, plants, roots, etc., which were credited with a particular efficacy. If they were worn around the neck, on the chest, under the arms, or around the legs, they could protect children from fits, ease the discomfort of teething, heal epilepsy, and still others which had the power to cause people to fall in love, and any other such ridiculous foolishness as he put it. This is what he says. The more I can, in my practice, restore the general useful rudiments and teach them to them without expecting from them the particular education demanded from physicians, and having often found that complete and prolonged helping illnesses rests so much on such things and hardly needs the help of a, of a physician and only depends upon lifestyle. And this he proceeded to do with Gasper. 
compiling a treatise which consists of 40 chapters and covers every conceivable known illness and its treatment. Hessler wrote passionately about the dire circumstances under which people lived and the terrible ignorance which caused unnecessary suffering and death. He was a very graphic writer, and the symptoms of rabies, poison by bushman arrows, snake bites and plants, smallpox, and other life-threatening conditions are so vividly described that no illustration is necessary. But who was Hessler, and where did he come from? This extraordinary man was born in Breslau, Silesia, in Germany, in 1764, and arrived at the Cape on board the Sparrowbank in 1785. He was initially employed by the VOC as a handyman. Goodness knows why. And then as a third surgeon in the hospital, after which he practiced at Paolo as district surgeon, before his appointment as a district surgeon of Graffinet, a decision he held in 1795. Chapter 25 is devoted to Mona's ailments, and given my interest in childbirth related deaths, I read it with interest. The chapter goes into some detail concerning inspiration, pregnancy, miscarriage, confinement, and the dire consequences of women in labor being attended by ill-informed so-called midwives, and of course, the dreaded child bed of the girl fever. At the heart of Hetzel's philosophy lay his abhorrence of ignorance, superstition, and laziness, and he did not mince his words. Under the heading about menstruation, lifestyle was at the root of the problem. He blamed a sedentary life, a bad diet which featured salted meats such as bottom, beef, and lamb, Salted fish, sharp spices such as chilies, which are used in chutney, some bowls, curries, and other spicy dishes. Also, the imbibing of strong drinks such as chocolate, coffee, tea, wine, and brandy. <laughs> as well as an excessive tiredness, strong emotions, etc. He warned that if the girl at this time of her life remains sitting indoors, did not get out into the fresh air, did not engage in activities which kept the body in complete motion. She would weaken and remain small and delicate of stature. Such was the lot of a large number of unhappy women who, either as a result of too much indulgence or confined circumstances in this dangerous time of life, lacked the benefit of movement and fresh air. He recommended movement, especially on horseback, healthy food as well as cheerful company, and all kinds of innocent amusements. But he did not need to give recipes for such remedies as were available. And this is what he had to say about procreation. Among the innumerable blessings which the great architect has honored us, and which is conducive to the promotion of our happiness, the procreation of our living lineage is probably the greatest and most mysterious. Thus he commences the section on pregnancy, <coughs> and then proceeds. Most pregnant women begin their pregnancies subject to nausea and vomiting, especially in the morning. Headaches and heartburn are also trying occurrences. Heartburn usually lasts only for a few months, but some women experience this until the first or second day after their delivery. But these complaints, he says, can be relieved by bleeding or gentle laxatives, such as a few figs and a handful of raisins poured with a bottle of water, and then strained sweetness. However, there is no better remedy than white magnesium, which does not only absorb acid, but is also an acid. Hetzner warned that every pregnant woman was in some danger of suffering and miscarriage. He advised women of a weak constitution that in order to prevent miscarriage, 
Then you should eat solid food, drink little tea, coffee, and other liquids, and not sit in front of a rolling stove all the time. <laughs> <laughs> the danger of miscarriage could be avoided by going to bed and rising early, avoiding damp houses, getting as much exercise in the fresh air without tiring themselves, and never going out in damp and misty weather, especially barefoot, if they could prevent this. <laughs> In the section about confinement, the dates irritation and contempt of power. We think plots abound, and at times is put them deep, deep into the power. Paper. I quote him verbatim. Loafers and vagabonds, etc., as soon as they are bankrupt or are too lazy to work, cannot think of a better way to survive than to pass themselves off as medicine men or witch doctors. The same goes for our midwives. The number of women murdered by bad treatment, the number of children who lose their lives in the birth process because of wrong and ignorant treatment, or one can justly say have been murdered, the number of the former will far exceed those who die of illnesses and the latter that they enter the world either dying or dead. And he goes on to say, one is sometimes astonished that women who have had an easy and fast delivery die within hours or days. This can be ascribed to the use of dangerous medicaments and the manual removal of the afterbirth, which most of the time cause deadly infections of the uterus. Let's move into considerable detail about the symptoms and daily effects of pedagogy. He considered that to a large extent, ignorance and ill treatment by self-appointed midwives were responsible for the death of the patient and the untold misery of the husbands and children who were left behind. But the real killer was something quite different. On 15 May 1850, 30 years of heads with death, a Jewish Hungarian obstetrician named Ignaz Semmelweis addressed a meeting of the Vienna Medical Society in which he announced his important discovery that the spreading of infections could be prevented by a simple act of washing the hands. This was met with a skepticism which lasted for years. Semmelweis then began exhorting his fellow patients uh, physicians at the Vienna General Hospital to wash their hands before examining women who were about to deliver their babies. This would help prevent a deadly malady known as childbirth or pepperal fever. In the mid 19th century, about five in a thousand women died in deliveries performed by midwives at home. While we were not just working at the best maternity hospitals in Europe and America performed deliveries, the maternal death rate was more than 10 to 20 times higher. The cause was invariably febrile fever. The symptoms recorded by Hitzner in 1793 were exactly the same. The reason for these deaths are clear. Medical students and their professors started the day by performing bare-handed autopsies on women who had died of febrile fever the day before and then went on to examine the women who were in labor. Several of us made the vital connection that puberal fever was caused by doctors from swearing some kind of morbid poison from the set to cause sis in the autopsy room to the women in the delivery room. Dr. Silvice's insistence on clear, clean hands for deliveries found a reverberation in this country where it seemed to agonize about the same deadly killer. The author, W. A. de Clark, was once the owner of the farm in Clan Grafenstein, wrote a movie play, Die Vertierende Fier, which translates as The Devouring Fire, about this far sighted doctor's crusade against against the toxic practices of his colleagues. I owe this information to my husband who obtained his PhD in the Department of Statistics and Gynecology of the University of Stonewash Medical School. And he reminded me of both of the As for Hitzner, 
If you remember, the Note 14 series was where the, re the remains of wrapping up an estate were just filed. So that's where we found these notes. There was a purse with, I remember, do you remember that little green purse? Yes. With clippings of silver coins. Does anybody know how that worked? These little clippings, they looked like toenail clippings, but they were silver in this purse. Does anybody know about that? That, that, oh. that, that was an old um, uh, way of, of defrauding uh, currency. You, you, you literally took bits off, uh, and it was a criminal offence, clipping coinage. Oh, okay. um, well, and, and, and why? What, then you, you melt it down? What do you do with it? Well, it's sort of part payment, small change. Um, but it, it's one of the reasons why a, um, um, you have a mint which sees that, you know, if this is a pound's worth of gold, that it is a pound, yeah. not 19 and 6. <laughs> So we must look up the name of the of the owner of that yes. purse. Yes, I, I can I can Can you remember it? I remember it well. I, in fact I looked at it um, when I was looking through the um King Emma's introduction. And there was this little purse. It's a it's a variation on the theme of pieces of eight. <laughs> Did you come across um, which were the first actual practicing hospitals at that time? Mm -hmm. This was here in Cape Town. Of the Somerset? No, 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 no. Before, much, much earlier. The reason for the establishment of the settlement here was to provide a hospital, a garden, and the defense mechanism. So the fort, the company gardens and the hospital were the first, oh, and then warehouses, the first buildings that were built. So is the hospital the one that was Do you remember I showed you the hospital in 1710? Yeah. And then it was rebuilt in different places. So that, that, that was the reason. And could anybody establish what kind of training the doctors had? I mean, you called Dr. Hayes now. Well, he came from Germany, so there must obviously have been decent training. But Jack, what qualifications they brought, I could tell you. In the hospital, um, the early hospital, you would have um, um, probably somebody who used to be the ship's doctor mm. would then be appointed as the hospital doctor. And then you, then you had people called sick comforters. And they were sort of like, what do you call it, paramedics. <laughs> and so sick comfort, you, you'll find that it's one of, one of the sort of middling jobs, is a sick comforter. And he, in, he actually comforted the sick as well, literally. Um, and we often read that the sick comforter took the place of the, the minister when he was ill and he read to the congregation. Uh, so just in response to the question of his training, I think medical education is an interesting question, and I just want to challenge something he said, if I might. He said he was born in Germany in 1764, he came to the Cape in 1785, which means he was 21. So he was quite young, mm -hmm. and medical training was very rudimentary all over the world until the late 1800s. So I had a relative who came to South Africa as a kind of medical missionary in 1830 on my father's side. And he had some medical training. So I looked this up of what's the medical training. He was from, from England. He came mostly as a missionary, but at times he worked as a district surgeon. He amputated legs, he doubted small parts of else. His training was extremely rudimentary. He, it, 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 in those days, you could go to a few lectures um, at a medical school in England and maybe do some more drives or apprentice yourself to a surgeon. It was very, very erratic. It was not standardized. There weren't curriculum. We didn't come out necessarily with a medical degree. So I think this question of bogus doctors and midwives mm -hmm. is an interesting question because I think everyone could point fingers and everyone asked, well, I'm a proper doctor, you're not a proper doctor. Mm -hmm. and, and some of the treatments that you said he gave were a little bit. <clears throat> Questionable answers. So there were obviously things people knew, but there was a lot of people didn't know. So medical education, what was 
a proper doctor, a well-trained doctor, I think was very open to interpretation. Um, so I think it would be interesting to read the treatise mm. in the light of that. Harriet Deacon was written about um, medical medicine in the, in the Cape. Yeah. Um, so there, there, is a, there is a sort of literature, and um, Elizabeth van Heningen later in the, yeah. in the 19th century. So, so there are some studies. Yeah. There are some more questions. Can you speak up? I hear that. So can you tell me how you spell syllabus? How do you spell? Syllabus. The doctor. Yeah. Oh. S-E-M-M-E-L-W-E-I-S-S. Sorry, this isn't quite related, but if one wants to go to the archives and mm -hmm. do one's own personal <coughs> ancestral research, do you just go there? Do you phone up? What, what does one do? You can just picture up in this always somebody who will so do just the dates. Where are the archives? They are in Lula Street in the old church. Street. If, if you download um, the, uh, guides for beginner researchers, um, and they're out of print. There's a series of three I showed you on a slide off at the end of my talk. They're guidebooks for beginner researchers. This is for inventories. There's one for slaves. There's one for places. But they're, they're downloadable from um, Tracing History Trust website. It's www.tracinghistorytrust, one word, .co.za. And then you look at the products page. And um, that helps you understand what names. you're looking for. Oh, when you say, the names. It tells you how to do research. It okay. tells you stories of people who have done research. So if you want to do a similar thing, like a family history or a place yeah. history, you can see how they did it and sort of follow their tracks. So there are also trained, I mean, experienced archivists you can, you can pay to do this. Sorry, when you say Cape, how far does the Cape go? The old Cape Colony grew from Table Valley, the original Cape Colony went right the way up to, to um, gosh, it was east. Depends when you're talking about, but the, 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 at its biggest, it was right through um, the existing western, eastern Cape, northern Cape, into the Free State, which was huge. To the Orange River. Mm -hmm. To the Orange River, yeah. yes. So and then it got um, split up. And Tony, just looking at the question from the other way around, what sort of material would the archives like to be acquiring now from a deceased estate? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, just so one point, my mother, for example, has kept household accounts, she's now 90, from the time she was 15 and started earning her own living. And their detailed notebooks of what she spent each month and how she stayed in this bunch of which she's kept until the age of 90. That's amazing. Now, the, the historian in me says that's actually of interest. Yes. Um, well, actually, would, would be of interest to you, huh? Most certainly. That's a good point. Because it's to do with. Um, well, here is an archivist, a retired archivist, Loretta. Can you answer? The thing is about the problem of finding a repository for those sorts of things is the, what should we say? Whether they're interested now, whether the institution is going to be sustained, and where there are other similar collections. So you've also got the option of libraries and museums as well. Um, with the official archives, there's an archives act, and they are obliged to take certain bodies and documents, yeah, which is official records. The private records, it's at their discretion. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. 
So you, you could ask them, but then you might think, well, well maybe there's a, there's a wonderful collection, for instance, the Stellenbosch University Library, at the moment, is, has special collections, which they look after beautifully. The, a lot of um, James Walton's vernacular stuff, there's a lot of vernacular architecture, is, is there, for instance? Um, so yes, you, you would need to ask around. And I would imagine um, clubs and associations, for example, the Mountain Club, which goes back to 1898, the archives are held by UCT, um, and there's some very interesting um, stuff there. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine other clubs and associations should also be thinking about uh, depositing minutes. Most certainly, most certainly. The difficulty is to find the appropriate, the appropriate place. As I say, the Vernacular Architecture Society now, we, we give this stuff to, to Stellenbosch because it's already started. So it's just adding. I don't know where Hilda Gonda Duckett's records are, for instance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just following up that, because it's an extremely important point. Um, there are people with specialist libraries, people that you know and I know, and a lot of people in this room know. And as they get older and they die off, and their families aren't interested, um, mm -hmm. and they say, oh, well, my family will look after it. Uh, but you spend a lifetime putting together a specialist collection, and it gets dispersed at 10 rand a volume. And my heart breaks every time I see things in... in Unfortunately, the there isn't a solution, and the case in point is my friend Jane Close, yeah. um, who amassed during her lifetime a library of 1,700 books yeah. on ceramics. Yeah. <laughs> right. The, the we've lost we've lost what was inside her head, but yeah. that library is still there, nobody wants it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. no, no, nobody, nobody. I've, I've asked overseas as well. People don't trust institutions in Cape Town. They don't trust the university. Um, and a lot of them are simply not interested in saying we can't take our board because we can't afford it. I've hit a dead end on, on sports history stuff. And you, you know, Contact villages, rugby club, the second oldest in the country. Yes, we've got an archive under the stairs with last week's bar receipts, <laughs> and it'll all be thrown out. Nobody's interested. I'm afraid it is an ongoing thing. Are there, are there any more? Can you tell me anything more about the surgeon you mentioned, the Fever? A surgeon called Lefebvre, yes. Have you come across him? Yes, yes okay, indeed. Do you his name? Do you, do you um, know anything more about him or should I go to the archives? No, um, we can find quite a lot about him. In, uh, seriously, get transcripts. Um, it was something, and you, if you look on the internet, yeah. and the... Uh, um, Doctors who were Huguenots, you know, there's quite a lot about you. Thank you. Any more? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um,